So here, a gentleman wrote a very nice letter about Dr. Vincent Adams in the issue of G.H.K. Lau. And he said, of these two people, Dr. Vincent Adams on one side and Dr. Guyana on one side, you know who I trust more? <laughs> Dr. Adams. <laughs> they have been demonized. Anybody speaking up for the truth, they have been demonizing them. Both sides. And they have been even even to this paper in, the, in this article in the blog, the guy shoot off an attack on Dr. Adams. But I can tell you, this is a man of integrity. This is a man of, as I said in my introduction, they stand among the uh, finest Guyanese who want to serve their God. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Mike. I, I'm going to make Mike my, my, my agent here. <laughs> no, but um, thanks for having me, and it's, it's a pleasure to be among this, this you know, the, the, the highly esteemed group of presenters, so I'm, I'm glad, and, and of course, um, you know, glad that, that we've got listeners out there, and, and hopefully, you know, they, they say it would, would help them to understand the issues better. Now, let me, now Janet did an excellent presentation there, um, but I think she left out something. You know, you got to give both sides of the story here sometimes. The minister, you remember Janet was talking about about the, the you know the, the guns that they were using and with the vibration and everything. And this is true. In the debate here a few weeks ago in Parliament from I think it was Minister Pat well um, not Minister the Opposition, Patterson, submitted a motion for on full coverage insurance, which is the topic that I'm really talking about. You know what the minister argument was? that they, these guns, are, the vibration is actually helping, the, the, is going to drive the fish towards closer to the shore. <laughs> I am not kidding you. So it's helpful instead of, so he's, you know, he's disputing what Janice is, 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 is saying, that this here is damaging fishing, and he said, no, it's going to help, because that vibration is going to chase them to the shore. But that's the level to which we, we, we've actually descended. Um, next slide. Now, it's obvious that, that we're moving at a very fast pace. Production is accelerating, you know. Every day, you know, we're all bragging. Within the next few years, we're gonna get over, over a million barrels per day. Nobody's against, I don't think most people are not against that. But you have to do it within the laws and to protect the environment. And science and technology is the only way we can do it. You cannot go with this lawlessness and, and compromise health, safety, and the environment. Um, and go do however you want to do. Now let me, they, here, here's the other thing that they tend to confuse you with. See this word risk? Even today, I was reading in, the, in, 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 in an interview from Mr. L uh, Rutledge, the head guy for Exxon. He said, oh, you know, so for something to, to occur, it's extremely low. Folks, a low number, risk, by the way, here's the, here's the mathematical, um, Formula for risk. Risk is equal to the probability of occurrence, meaning the chance. You know, if somebody say you got a 50 50 chance, you know, it's, it, you know, it could be either side. You, you know, even if it's 10% chance, multiply 10% by 100 billion. A small number multiplied by a big number, guess what you're going to get? A big number. Since so it's, 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 risk is equal to chance times the consequence. So when you hear Mr. Rutledge and others say that it's a small chance, it's not the chance, it's the consequence. It was a very small chance that a Makanda would have occurred. Nobody would doubt that. Very small chance, one in whatever. We had another spill in the North Sea. We were 167 people died. Nope, it was a small chance it occurred. What are the consequences? You multiply the consequence by, by a small probability, you're going to get a big number. So, so they want to talk about the small chance, but they don't want to talk about the consequence of it occurring. All you got to do is occur once. We all drive our vehicles, for example, and every day we drive in the speed limit says 60, we drive over 100 miles per hour. Someday it will catch up with you. Someday it will catch up with you. Now, um, let me, so here are some of the, 
the incidents that I told you about, and a couple of them hit home. Go to the um, to the next slide for me, and we can come back. Though, and you know, I'm going to give you a test on this here when we're done. But this here is relevant. And all this diagram is telling you here's a well, and here's how you drill a well. And I, you know, the, the key thing that is it's it's mud. Mud is like the blood in drilling. Mud is a dirty thing, but we, here it's. We've got mud engineers, guys who sit on these rigs. They have PhDs just in mud, believe it or not. That mud, what it does, you put mud down this hollow pipe, and here is a drill bit. You turn the drill bit because you remember you got it's like a shovel. You dig out, you dig in a hole, you gotta move the dirt someplace. Well, as you drill, you know, probably over a mile deep, you gotta get all that dirt up. So you, you pump mud down the, the drill pipe. It goes through the bit. Now that bit is, these bits, it's made out of diamond. Diamond is probably the hardest material known to mankind. So it's a, if you can steal one of those, you could become rich. <laughs> so, and, and that's not kidding because the, the first thing that these guys would normally do is try to protect that bit. And make sure that they don't lose that bit down the hole. But anyway, you drill, the mud comes up, you drill this stuff, it comes up on the other side of the pipe, in the hole, it comes up here because it brings all of that stuff, that cuttings. Here's the key to the mud. The mud has to be thick enough for that, all that material to float in it. So it comes to the, and here's the other part of it. It has to be heavy enough for it to withstand the pressure in this reservoir. These reservoirs is like over 6,000 pumps per square inch. On the surface, it's only 14 pumps per square inch. So imagine. So that's how you get blood because of that high pressure. When you tap into that high pressure, you can get a blood. So that mud is, has to be heavy enough to make sure that it's pushing up against, um, you know, whatever pressure is coming in. So that mud brings up the cuttings. It goes into what is called a mud pit. It flows here. It drops up the cuttings, okay? And then the clean mud, if you will, comes back here and recycles back. So you have that recycling. Now, why I tell you this? You see the small chance? We had an incident. A lot of people didn't know about it. It was in the newspapers when I was there. And not our company, not, not, not Exxon, they were drilling one of these exploration wells. The company that was drilling, it's a big international company. That's where that came in and, and tried to make excuse, which really ticked me off. But anyway, they were drilling. I got a, re I got a, I was, I was, as a matter of fact, I was up here, something, I had a meeting up here somewhere. I got a call from my officer saying, Doc, we've got, you know, they just reported we've got a little mud spill in the ocean. I said, oh yes? He said, but it's not no big deal. I said, I need for you to go get you and a couple others to get on that ship immediately and go interview everybody, and especially the operators, to find out exactly what happened. Because I know from experience. 99% of the time, what they tell you happened, it's not what happened. You're not there. You know, lo and behold, when they got there, you know what was happening? A valve, a valve that was reported to be defective for three months or something within that period of time. They didn't repair that valve, which is a big sin. There's a valve, that mud is supposed to circulate back down there to stop a blow, you know, that high pressure. It was emptying the mud into the ocean. So when they reported, fortunately for us, one of the guys who worked on that ship was passing by and saw the mud being dumped. God sent him to see that mud being dumped into the ocean. So instead of coming back into the well, you remember what I told you? To push the pressure, we could have had an empty hole with a maybe, maybe a big blow because there was nothing to stop any pressure from coming back here. There wasn't anything to stop the, the to bring the cuttings back up. It would squeeze, freeze all this drill pipe. Next thing you know, you have one big problem on, on your hand. So when you when you hear there's a there's a small risk, do not believe it. And these guys, to me, they're taking things lightly, much too lightly. Um, so when you hear these small risks, you know, all it takes is one time. Remember, we're dealing with the human factor. How many of us here? Go party party on a Sunday night and report for work on a Monday morning or so. 
and you're tired, you're sleepy, you don't, you know, instead of going through procedures, so you, you take shortcut because, you know, well, you know, it, 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 you, you, you can take a chance. And that's when things happen. So when you hear this thing about small risk, it's light talk. It's the consequences that can happen just that one time you're going to make a mistake. Okay, go back, yeah. So go back. Um, of course, we had the Macondo, very similar, human error again, that, you know, that happened in the Gulf. We know about, well, the Piper Alpha was another one, just human error. The guy came in the afternoon, a pump went down with, with some condensates of some gas. It's on the repair, he's checking out, you know, it's shift torn over. The guy who's taking over got a little bit busy. The guy who's handing over the shift just threw the paper in his desk, he left. Guess what happened the night? The, the one, there were two pumps. The one that was not, that was in repair, that was what he left in the desk. The other pump went by. Guess what the guy did? He switched back into the pump that was in, that was on the repair because he didn't know that pump was on the repair, because he didn't look at the paperwork. The whole, the whole rig and everything was 167 people died. And it was because of that accident off Aberdeen why they started all these um, petroleum regulations. That was the accident when we, they started generating all of the petroleum regulations. That's where all of the safety things come from. That is why we have to take these things very safe, safely. And I, Exxon, Exxon itself, when I was at EPA, um, I mean, this day was by any newspaper, by the way. They had six small spills. They were forgiven the first three, and guess what it was again? You know, like, your hose, and they were small spills. You know, you, you, when you buy even your electrical equipment, you remember there's a tank with some safety precautions that you shouldn't do? They had some hoses, and it says, you have to inspect the hoses before use. Six times. Even their own procedures say that you have to inspect the, the procedure. They ignored it. Those are precursors for serious accidents. Precursors. Because if you're not following those basic rules, you're going to do the same thing with something more dangerous than that. So when I hear that, you know, they say these type of things, you know, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it bothers me a whole lot of time because it tells me that they're not taking stuff seriously. And of course, you know, I'm not, um, um, Janet covers it, covered this here, here very well. But here's the other thing, you know, we talk about incidents and stuff like that. But I'm going to get into, to Janet mentioned, you know, what, what happens, like, you know, over time, you know, to the environment. I'm going to go get into to mainly you know, what happens in the case of a spill. Um, and just to, to add to what Janet says, in terms of, of the water that is being produced, this water is hot. The water of the ocean is about 20 degrees um, centigrade. The water that comes out of the ocean, that they dump into the ocean, which is a sin in itself, is over 55 degrees centigrade. On top of that, that water is being dumped with oil. Because oil and water comes up, it's mixed. They separate out the oil, which goes north or wherever it goes. And that water that has all kinds of toxic stuff, mercury, lead, and radioactivity, by the way, they dump it into the ocean when they should be re-injecting it. Every single standard says you've got to re-inject it back into the reservoir. I fought that, and when I left, we had already directed that that will not happen. Not only me. The government had a team, and th these are facts, by the way. So don't let them, you know, you know, fill people up with a lot of BS. We directed Exxon. We had a meeting, and it was the GGMC folks, the Department of Energy, and even their own consultants from Canada. We told, we made the decision that that water has to be re-injected back. Well, as soon as, as I left. That they threw that out of the window and the water is being dumped into the ocean. It's being dumped at a certain concentration of water. You can't remove all of the oil. For every billion barrels of water dumped, and there's going to be several billions of barrels over the life of the field, 35,000 to, to probably 35 to 40,000 barrels of oil goes with it. It's mixed in, you know, it's not, they're not dumping it by itself. 
but over the life of that field, you will have a few thousand barrels, a few hundred thousand barrels of oil, pure oil, dumped in the ocean. So that's what I'm getting at when, you know, what Janet was talking about, over time. That's all in Nigeria. Well, that's uh, here. The other thing that is worrisome is this inadequacy of the spill. You know, how do you respond if you get a spill? I, I can tell you, because I did not sign this document, I, I refused to sign it because of what it was. Um, now you're hearing, there, there used to be, the, you know, every time they say, children, well, we don't have it, and now documents start coming out, they start coming up with this $600 million. So let me, let me tell you what the facts are. Next slide. Okay, here it is. Folks, and people come and say, well, Vince, you know what is this controversy? There's no controversy. And when you hear, well, show us the document. This is what's written into the permit. There's no controversy here. When I arrived, the Lisa Wong project, which was the number one, which was the first project, it was signed already. So the guy brought the Lisa two, and he said, well, we got to get it. I said, no, no. I said, the Lisa Wong says, in accordance with the contract, by the way, that you could be self-insured. Self-insured means that SO, which is a, uh, this is important, folks. SO is a limited liability company. And, you know, the, 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 the experts um, at the back there would, would, would tell you that those are some of the, the games that some of these cooperations play to, to insulate themselves from liability. So they hire ESO, for example, and ESO is going to, ESO is, is not Exxon signed this permit, folks. These permits are signed by ESO or EEPGL. And every single one of these classes, the permit holder, it doesn't say Exxon. So guess what Lisa Wan said in accordance with the permit? Anything happen? Guess who's responsible? The permit holder. Well, guess what the permit holder had? No assets. Because their asset was reliant on producing oil. At the time, they never produced a barrel of oil. But they're supposed to be responsible for it. So you can imagine, let's see, you get just a small size of what happened in the Macondo. What are they going to cover it? That insulates Exxon and them. I said, no, no, they, they're not going to work that way. I want the parent companies to give us a guarantee to say, you will cover everything. And that's what's causing the whole confusion. Well, I said, you're not going to produce a barrel of oil until I get it. So here's, here's the language that I put into Lisa 2 permit. The EPGL, which is SO, shall have insurance. It said shall. 12.3 permits subject to fulfillment of correspondence dated this, indicating commitment of EPGL to obtain such insurance for cover and, and proof of it. This here is a letter that they're hiding. They're hiding that letter. It's, it, this is in the permit. See, you can't deny that such a letter exists because it's in the permit. So they say, well, if you, you know, I'm saying thing, if I've got, let me show them. Hell, it, it, you said, you know, it, it's in the permit. They're even, they're even going ahead and put, using my same language in all of the permits that they're currently writing, and it has that. 12.4, EPA shall review the insurance policy. And it says, it goes on, it has to have, make sure it's up to date, and you're paying your premium. So, you have a policy. There is a, this says you've got a policy. 12.5, this is the catch here now. EPGL must provide from parent company and affiliates more legally binding documents undertaken to provide financial pay their respective obligations if EEPGL fails to do so. What does that mean to you? Isn't that unlimited coverage or full coverage? You have insurance here by ESO, and this here says anything over and above insurance the parent company has to cover it. Plain language. Here's the other clause. If that wasn't convincing enough, EPJ Baba shall be liable for any discharge of pollution in any amounts. It didn't say for $100 billion in any amount. 
So EPGL is a, is a permit holder. You're in charge of any amount, of, of all amounts, unlimited amounts. It doesn't matter what size it is. So you can start with this clause. So okay, you go, you fill part of it with insurance, right? But there's still a bunch left after that. The rest of it is covered by this. Folks, there is no debating here. So all the smoke that they're trying to blow, it's written into that Lisa 2 permit. But here's even more than that. They themselves copy exactly the same language in all of the other, in all of the other projects. And the Payaro, in the yellow tail, and even when they're renewing the Lisa 1, when it came up for renewal, they copy the same language. That's the bare facelessness that we've seen. And then they're still arguing that this doesn't exist. Go read any of the permissions here. This is legal. They have now Lisa 1 and Lisa 2 operating without these requirements. That's the lawlessness that we have. Next slide. Um, like I said, they need to make public that letter. Okay? Parent company. Here's the other thing. In the debate, by the way, the same minister who said that the fish, you know, it's a good thing to, you know, the fish is going to drive it, drive, I mean, the, the, the vibration and stuff is going to drive the fish to shore. Was talking about costs, where both ministers, Minister Barr and Minister that that in. Oh, the cost is going to be, you know, too much, you know, for anybody to have full coverage. Folks, it's a guarantee letter. It's to put something in writing to say, if anything happens, I want to, this here is your guarantee. Put your signature on it. Even today, every, and they've got this talk, which is the same talk they gave me. Oh, Vince, you know, here. We rest on, you think we would ever walk away? I said, okay, that's fine. Put it in writing. If it is, the one thing I learned, you know, everybody is talking about the United States government, how the, the bureaucracy we have. The one lesson that they teach you every single day, if it is in writing, it does not exist. So don't come to me and tell me you will never walk away. So that's how I got those languages in there. So you're not going to produce a a barrel of water until you put that language in there. It's the same thing here. That guarantee does not cost them a dime. Yet we have ministers who are arguing it's going to be too expensive. The insurance is the premium, which Exxon is, which you're paying, but this guarantee here does not cost them a dime. Again, Roger signed, he himself, who's denying all it, he signed all four permits now. His name is on every single one of those permits. The Lisa 1 and Lisa 2, they're operating without meeting any of these requirements. Now we've got like a triple jeopardy, I call it. We're accelerating production. You, you all know, anytime you're trying to get things done, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you know, you're hustling to, to increase production or increasing, you're getting busy, you're opening up, that's when the risks increase for something to happen. They, they're operating. Here, well, here's the other thing here recently. When our prices were start going up, they went, to, you know, in the, in the environment impact assessment, it's the Bible, we call it the Bible. You never go out of the Quran. You don't go against it, those are sacred. It says in plain, simple words, the operating limit is 120,000 bars per day. You never ever go over that. As a matter of fact, in the United States, you know what the companies have to do? Not to make, when we tell them it's 120,000 dollars per day, for example, they, they're going to make sure that their internal procedures is going to say they're going to operate at the harm. They normally use 10%. They're going to cut back by which 10% is 12. So they're going to make sure that their internal procedure will set it as the limit to be 108,000 dollars per day. You know what these folks did here recently when I was They've opted and they're bragging about it. They've opted to like 150,000 barrels per day. Which means that they're compromising that safety. Here's a safety limit. It says that's the safe operating limit. It doesn't mean that you can't go ahead and do it, but you have to go through a procedure to do it. They didn't go and through any procedure. They didn't even, probably didn't even inform the, the EPA that they were going to do this. So those are the kinds of we've got. You're operating here, there's, you're going full, you're going, you're accelerating production, you're operating above the safety limit, 
which means you increase the risk for something to happen. But then the third problem is, if something happens, there's no coverage. So you're getting hit from the front and the back. You know, and I can't help. It was only yesterday, Mr. Rutledge, again, had an interview, I think it's oil and something. Here's what he says. When he was asked, when I asked if there's a limit to what it will cover, he goes, the company intends to go above the commitment on paper to respond to a disaster. But he won't put it in writing. He's, then here's what he says. These guys, you know, just amusing. There is no limit to what we would do to respond. He said this, this is, in, this is in quotes. There is no limit. However, they don't want to put it in writing. If you're so sorry, which is what I told Mr. Mr. Hanson, I said, okay, if you're saying that son is never gonna put it in writing, that should be easy. Why are they, why don't they want to put it in writing? And here's the other thing that he kept saying. That if something happens, they're gonna cover only reasonable and legitimate cost. He's been saying that several times. So he's speaking from both sides of his all. Well, there's more than more than two sides. He's speaking from all kinds of sides of his mouth. So, so those are the, that's what we're dealing with. This kind of fancy language and, and stuff is to really confuse uh, people. To, then he said, there are other commitments that we make as part of putting paperwork in place that gives people comfort. I don't know about the but it ain't giving me no comfort. And this is the same company, by the way. You remember telling about them six spills that we had, those little spills? We decided to take them to court because they refused to pay 500 US dollars. We decide to take them to court because I, you know, I, that's a fine. Let, let me see in court. It was dropped as soon as I left. And not only was it dropped, you know what? They removed one of the brightest attorneys that I had a privilege, a young kid. They removed the attorney from EPA. Next slide. Oh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, the minister and them in the debate, they say, wait, hey, are we before that? Well, if Vince has any letter or anybody got any letter, come and show us, you know, because he's talking about this insurance and this whole liability stuff and, and the Bank of Guyana getting involved. It. Well, guess what? A letter appeared a few days ago. So now the letter is in the newspapers. And it says exactly what I've been saying. There's insurance. As a matter of fact, this letter was signed by the lady who was acting after I left. And she said, well, I can't even. Nice. No, I don't think it is. But anyway, she said everything that she said, bring your insurance, all the policies that you have. We need to have this letter was dated December 15. This was after 11 by the way, of 2020. It says, I acknowledge in the very first part, I acknowledge receipt of your plan to cover liability. I acknowledge receipt. We need to meet on the 22nd, bring all your insurance policies and everything that you have. Then we ought to be learned in this letter here, which is what I know about, I talked about that in night, that there's a tripartite agreement with the Bank of Guyana because the Bank of Guyana is in charge of insurance, etc. When I told him, when I was talking about we had a meeting at the Bank of Guyana, oh no, I, I dreamed all this stuff. Well, everything is in this letter. When it hit the fan now with the EPA, I hear they got all kinds of this investigation how to figure out who leaked the letter. They're going after the messenger instead of this here. So that's how we operate it. Yeah, they want to they want to find it, you know, find yes, whoever it is. You know, but not the message because now they got caught with the pants down. And there might be more to come too. Anyway, next time. Um, so here's where the time meets the road, folks. Now they're talking, now they're only talking, and I believe they're putting it out there to see what kind of, you know, how people are gonna respond. They're saying, they're now carrying 600 million, remember? And going back, that 20, that, that, um, the, the date of that letter that I said, 
they need to, the, the, the March 29 letter, which is that letter that Henson brought to me in order for me to sign off and not permit. And when he brought that letter, he said, could you please sign it? This is 2019. He said, could you please sign the lease too? We agreed to go with this guarantee, you know, they're, they're paying company guarantee, you know, even though he was pushing back. He said, but could you sign this letter so that our, our investors do not get nervous? In any case, the reason to is not going to start until three years hence. I said, sure. We got three years. He said, but because I want the three companies, Hess, Exxon, and um, Synop, to, since it's three of us, to decide how we're going to split up that guarantee. They were meeting with the EPA, my lawyer, the EPA, frequently on, you know, coming up, they would come up with a draft, he would bring it to me, we would look, no, this has to change. As to how the three of them, the three of them would cover it. And we were getting close because in 2020, now the yellow tail came up. The yellow tail, they were hurrying out to get yellow tail on, online. And I said, guess what, I will not be signing off on the yellow tail until you get this letter of guarantee. So they started rushing out. I was removed in, 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 in August of 2020, September, they pushed that aside, and they're denying that it ever happened, except now the documents are coming up, they pushed that aside, and that was it um, for, for that letter. So here's what you're hearing them talking about now. They're talking about 600 million in insurance, and suddenly there's a two billion parent company, instead of an unlimited number that I was talking about, they're saying now, oh, Lodges himself said that, and I believe even the vice president. So now we're talking about the parent company coverage of two billion, not unlimited, two billion. So look at this, folks. Macondo was 70 billion. Let me say we got a Macondo type spill, which again, it's not impossible because it happened, okay? That's 3%. Of the Macondo. Even if you got one tenth of the Macondo, that's still three times that 2.6 billion. The question that needs to be answered by these folks who will be paying anything over and above this so called 2 billion that they're now working? And they're proud of it. When, of course, you remember I told you about that 500 spill, that $500 that they refused to pay. But here's the other catch. Do you remember what I said about what they're saying that they're only paying, they're only paying reasonable <laughs> and legitimate cost? Even it gets worse. There's no baseline. We don't have any, if we get damage, you could only pay for the damages. But there's no baseline to tell us what was damaged. And that is why when he says legitimate and reasonable, that's where he's going. You gotta prove to him, you gotta prove the damage and put a number in it. So that's where this is going. We have no baseline to say this is what we have today, and anything over and above that would be a damage. So when he says legitimate and reasonable, watch out. Next slide. And we, of course, we all heard what happened in Peru. And, and you know, we, were, we had 12,000 12, by day, and they reported it. They had to, whole lot and some of them couldn't even leave the country and now the government and folks have filed um, a fine of 600 million plus of 4.5 billion. They reported to start with and reported a low number and this was the damage it cost. And this here is a small spill by 12,000 barrels, it's a relatively small spill. It devastated the, the, the environment. Next slide. Okay, what must be done? Transparency, no question. They need to show the public these policies and this guarantee that they talk about. Show us what is there to hide. This belongs to the people. If you want this whole thing to go away, show us. Okay? And explain who pays for that any spill over 2.6 billion that you're talking about. This here was very important. EPA oversight 24-7 on those FPS, on those ships. Like I said, 99% of the time what you hear is not what actually is occurring. It so happened that because of that, when I recognize it, we went out, we got a World Bank, a $1 million 
grant from the World Bank. The World Bank, <coughs> EPA, and the Department of Energy got together, put together a plan. A, a, a highly specialized unit of petroleum engineers with five years, ten years experience, geological engineers, because we don't have any of those in Guyana. We put that together, we were going out for budget, of course, in 2020, what happened was the COVID and then the switching government, so we, we put a hold on it until 20, 2020, was that when the new government took over, they scrapped it. So when I spoke about them scrapping, they said, oh no, we, we didn't scrap anything, we increased it by, they now have 13 people, which is BS, because what they did, they combined a couple of organizations. But none of those people in that 13 that he was talking about had, had nothing to do with that plan. But what was funny up to yesterday or the day before, the big headline was the EPA director contradicts the minister. The minister said we got 13. When they asked, when they asked the, the EPA director, he said, I know nothing but, but no plan, no World Bank plan that you're talking about, but I can check. Go to the next slide. So they were denying all along, well, I don't know what he's talking about, until this shows up in the newspapers. So that was when the minister said, oh, shucks, you know, I can't get out of this now. That's how we came up in the, in the debate department. Say, well, no, we got 30 people. We never scrapped the plan. And when they called the director, the director got off guard. You know, they didn't, they didn't talk. The director said, which plan are you talking about? I wasn't there, so I know about no plan. So now, again, they got caught with the plan. Here is the, the document. Institutional Assessment and Action Plan for the Oil and Gas Sector for the Environmental Production Agency. It was an entire organization of 36 people, highly qualified to have 24 7 coverage on the boat. Now they're talking about we got satellites. You can't see what's happening in the ship. You might be able to see an oil spill, but by the time you see an oil spill from satellite, the spill is a spill. You have no control over it. You have to have people on board seeing everything that happens on a daily basis to make sure that you cover everything. Is that, that was the last? So that's, so that's my, my spiel. And I appreciate, you know, you listening.